Please take your Bibles and go to James chapter 1, if you would, please. James chapter 1. As you're turning there, I do uh, echo what Brother Coomer was saying just about every time that he got up to preach. He just complimented uh, the music that we have around here. Amen. And uh, we should not take that for granted. And it's interesting that I appreciate so much the songs and the hymns that we sing where it really puts us in tune with the Savior first and then the tune later, <laughs> you know. And so uh, it's, it just ministers to the spirit of man. And that's the way it ought to start. It ought to start from the inside out. But I appreciate uh, the music. I told Brenda this morning, I said, I'm just going to come to church. I'm going to sit there. I'm not going to sing the songs. I'm just going to sit there and I'll just preach when my time comes. And then we start singing the first song, There's Power in the Blood. Well, how can you sit there and not sing? So I sang every song anyway. So I don't know if this means that uh, my preaching is going to peter out as we go <laughs> or what. But at the same time, uh, those who don't sing, I don't know how you do it. I really don't know how you do it. I'm just sort of wrapping my head around that because it just, every song has such a message to it. And uh, it just puts a little bit of a, you know, uh, oomph to your spirit as well. And then you sing some of these songs and you carry it with you throughout the rest of the day. And it just helps you. Amen. I like that verse of scripture says, he put a new song in my heart, even praise to our God. Amen. All right. James chapter one. I want to begin reading here in uh, verse five down through verse 18 uh, for our reading. Uh, as you know, we've been going through the book of James, slowly but surely, and this, with the, just the parentheses that we've had with the meetings and then uh, my sickness last week, I just want to uh, maybe hit a couple of the high points as we move into new territory here in the book of James. So let's begin reading here in verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low. Because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it uh, perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Of course, most of us, when we think of this particular chapter, we think here of verse 5. Verse 5 says, if any of you lack wisdom. And I think it's important when we look at passages of Scripture like this to keep it in its proper context. And wisdom is really the subject matter here. And it says, if you lack wisdom, which is simply applying truth. And so when we talk about asking God for wisdom, we're saying, Lord, how can I apply the truth given in your word? What you've said to me, how can I apply it to the particular situation that I find myself in? So if any of you, it doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter your station in life, doesn't matter whether you're educated or uneducated, whether you feel worthy or unworthy, he says, if any of you lack wisdom, you can ask of God and that he will give it to you. He says that he doesn't upbraid you. He doesn't give you a hard time. And of course, 
as we remember going through this verse of scripture earlier, the word upbraid means to mock and make fun. And, and so he's not going to scold you either in regards to coming to him finally. You may say, you know, I've tried this, I've tried that, and you know, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just gonna turn my life over to God, or I'm going to, you know, you get things right, you say, I've, I've tried my own way long enough, and that's not working, I guess I'll try God. And let me just say that he's not gonna braid you for that, upbraid you, he's not gonna mock you, he's not gonna say, well, it's about time you came, I've been waiting for this day for so long. He says, you know, I, you asked me for wisdom, in the sincerity of your heart. And he said, I'm not gonna make fun of you. I'm not gonna say, why didn't you come sooner? Uh, I'm just gonna give you exactly what you need, but not just that, I'll give you more than what you need. And you know, God does what he does always in abundance. I find that interesting when you think of the children of Israel as God took care of them, as he fed them every day with manna, as he sent quails at one time, and so on, he always took care of them and gave them more than enough. And so we need to understand that as believers that God always gives us more than enough. Our sufficiency truly is of the Lord. So when we think of this passage of scripture and the subsequent verses here, I think it's important for us to keep in its context that wisdom is what's being discussed here. Sometimes we'll use this verse to cover all aspects of the subject of prayer. And that's, that's not something we should do because that's not the subject matter at hand. When you take a particular subject in the Word of God and you want to deal with it in its totality, then you have to compare Scripture with Scripture. And so that way you can get a really a, 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 a total view of that particular a doctrine or that particular aspect of the Christian life. But James is trying to tell uh, believers how to live through some uh, turbulous times, some troubled times, some trials. They were going through some intense persecution. And so James is trying to say, look, God will help you live out what he's told us in his word to live out those truths, to make it applicable to your life, to where you can have an enjoyable life, a fulfilling life. That's the crown of life, amen? And so we see here, it's so important for us to keep this in its context when we think about these other verses. If you'll look here at verse six, it says, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Now I brought out, as we closed out the message a couple of weeks ago, about how the request should be without a doubt. And of course, when we're thinking about that, once again, it's discussing the subject of wisdom. Uh, there have been times in my life, and I'm sure in yours, that you have come to certain points where there's a decision or a circumstance that has arisen in your life, and you're saying, how do I maneuver through this? How do I get through this? What's the right way to go? What's the wrong way to go? Uh, how can I take all the various decisions that lie before me, which it doesn't seem like any of them are bad in and of itself, but what's the perfect decision for me to make at this particular time of my life? And you ask of God and you say, well, okay, <laughs> he that wavers is like a wave of the sea with the wind and toss for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. And so you say, how do I apply this uh, truth to my life. And of course, we have to understand who we're praying to. We're praying to God. And so we need to understand that we're not focusing on our request. We're focusing on the Lord that we make our request to. Realizing that as the applied word is given to our lives, then he will help us in making the right decision. And so there comes that point in our life where we submit ourselves to what the will of the Lord is in any given particular matter, not, really, not re saying that oh, my prayer is answered or not answered because I got what I wanted. See, sometimes God in his grace doesn't give us what we ask for because he knows that's not the best thing for us. And so when we think of wisdom here, in this particular context, we need to understand that he's gonna help us through the various aspects of life. 
And that's what he's trying, James is trying to get across to these believers who are being just persecuted and run out of town and their homes are being broken up, which we find it hard to imagine in our North American culture how that could ever take place. It's hard to wrap our heads around that truth. And so you may think this is an extreme circumstance, but if God will help people through the extremes of life, he can help us through the day-to-day things of life as well, the decisions we have to make. And so we see here the request without a doubt, and of course that's in, in center in our attention on the wisdom, how to apply biblical truth. So you're never devoid of having to make a decision uh, apart from the Word of God. And this is where you see in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, just how uh, powerful the Word of God is and how it applies to every aspect of our life because verse 17 says that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And so we can take the truth of what's given to us from Genesis to Revelation, and we can ask God for the wisdom and the application of His Word to every circumstance of life and be assured that He has the answer for us. And so we're not just flipping a coin and saying heads or tails or boy, I'll just go out and I'll take a poll and I'll, I'll ask this one, this one, this one, this one. No, God will give you the wisdom you need to apply his word where you can live a happy, fulfilled, persevering life. So request without a doubt. Now, as we look at verse seven, I see here where I've entitled this in my outline, request denied. And here in verse 7 it says, For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. One of the examples we see in the Old Testament in regards to this principle of the vacillation of living life is uh, King Saul. King Saul, of course, we see him back and forth where he believes God, where he doesn't believe God. And one of the things he wrestled with so much was at one moment he was humble and then the next moment he was filled with pride. And before we're so critical of Saul, which I'm all for criticizing the, uh, the sins of his life and so on, but many times in these Bible characters, we find ourselves there, where it's back and forth, back and forth. And that's why I think, you know, one of the detriments to life in general is uh, Proverbs mentions to us in uh, chapter six, he says, you know, these six things does the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination to him. And he goes off and talks about a proud look. And so we have to understand that the root sin of all sin is a sin of pride, where we think we can live absent uh, from God and doing our own thing. And, hey, I got this figured out. I've been there, done that, and this is the way it worked out before. And so I'll just keep going this direction. And that's really pride. And what we need to understand is there's never a time where we ought to live without a spirit of submission as well as humility to the will of God in our life. If you look at verse 8, it says here, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. That's, there's a, I entitled that restless. How that many times we're restless as we live life and we seek to apply uh, sometimes a biblical truth to our life and sometimes going our own way. And I think one of the best examples of this is uh, Peter as he walks on the water. Let's take our Bibles and go to Matthew chapter 14, if you would. Matthew chapter 14. I think this is one of the uh, accounts in the scriptures where uh, we hear a lot of messages about or we reference this quite a bit. And uh, it's got so many powerful truths in it, but I just want to emphasize a couple of things in this passage, how that we see some vacillation taking part uh, in uh, Peter's life. And uh, once again, as we saw maybe some of ourselves in Saul, we can find ourselves in Peter as well. And so it says here in chapter 14 of Matthew, beginning in verse 22, the scripture says, and behold, Oh, excuse me, that's not the passage I want, is it? No, yeah, chapter 14, verse 22. And behold, a woman of, that is not the one I want. Um, Matthew 14, yeah, I'm chapter 15. 
Well, you know, now I can always make an excuse in these days, <laughs> but I'm not going to do it. I just turned the wrong page, that's all. Have you ever done anything like that? Yeah. Amen. I, I plead for mercy. <laughs> okay. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship. There we go. And to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the even, evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. It's about three o'clock in the morning. It says, and when the disciples saw him, verse 26, walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. Uh, I'd say they were troubled. It says here, but straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And you know, God's not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So if you ever go into a situation of life and you're gripped by fear, understand that that's not God bringing that your way. Because anytime God shows up, he says, fear not. And so we're, we're talking about whatever circumstance of life you find yourself. There's never a place for fear as we are in the hands of Almighty God. And John chapter 10 says, no man will be able to pluck you out of my Father's hand. And so you and I need to understand that security that we have in Christ, not just in the good times, but also in the bad times as we would count them to be. Verse 28 says, and Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Amazing. Think about that. Now, many of we men, we've been fishing there uh, at Point de Bois, the men's retreat, looking forward to this year. But at the same time, you know, you think about, there you are in a boat, and the boat that we're in of a Point de Bois is nothing like the boat uh, that they were in on the Sea of Galilee. But just stop and think about that. If you saw Jesus during one of those storms walking on the water to, towards your boat, and uh, you, wh how would you feel? And then when he'd say, come, get out of the boat and walk to me. And you get out and you start walking on the water. I mean, that's, that's something. And so here you have Peter, his eyes are focused on the Savior. And so whatever God has told him to do, he does. And you see that his, his request is being honored, his step of faith is being honored. Now, we're, what can we gain from that? As God has stated, whatever he stated in his word that applies to your particular need, you can count on it. There's no logical or natural way that Peter could wrap around in his mind how he could get out of that boat, walk on that water, and go to Jesus, except he believe in what Jesus has said. And so there comes a point in time in your life and my life when the doubts roll in, that when we look in his word and he says this, that, or the other, we have to focus on what he has said, who he is, and then put our faith and trust in that, and not the circumstances, not our feelings, and not whether it even makes sense or not. Because without faith, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it's impossible to please him. He says here, he says, and he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, and this is where we get into trouble, we start out in faith. We start out believing in his word. But the longer the situation goes, the more we get our focus off the Lord and we start looking at our circumstance, we begin to sink. We lose sight of the truth of the Word of God. More importantly, as we see the Word of God is pointing us to Jesus, we get our eyes off the Lord. And he says these words, <clears throat> but when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And so many times it hits us emotionally first. And then he says, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. He wasn't asking the Lord to save his soul from hell. He was saying, Lord, save me from this circumstance. 
And the wonderful thing about this is, is he stopped at that time looking at the wind, looking at the waves, looking at the circumstance. He came right back. At first he was distracted. And sometimes you and I may get distracted with the situation we're going through. And so then we come back and he says, hey, 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 I'm right here, I'm right here. And you call out to him and say, Lord, save me. In other words, help me. As you cry out for help, he's right there. And that's what we find happening right here. He says, and when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried saying, Lord, save me. And immediately, I like that. Immediately, he's not gonna put you through the ringer, so to speak. He's not putting you on probation. He's not gonna say, well, we'll just see, you know, we'll, we'll let you get down to about, you know, neck deep and then I'll reach down and save you. No, he reaches right down. Immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O oh, thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? In other words, you get off your, your doubting and start focusing on the truth, the veracity of the word of God and what he has said. You focus on that and God will save you out of that difficulty. Doesn't mean, as we see in the context of our passage of scripture, if you'll go there, back to James, you notice it says, let patience have her perfect work. We learn that it's not, it's not getting us out of the human circumstance. It's helping us go through and bear up under that human circumstance. That's why people can go through uh, years of debilitating illness. They can go through war zones. They can go through intense persecution when they're in jail for the faith uh, for years. Uh, they can go through those things having no relief, ultimately at times even given their very life in death like a John the Baptist, like a James in Acts chapter 12, and so on, realizing that, hey, my care is, uh, in, I am in God's care, and God will take care of me through this entire circumstance. We just need the patience to bear up underneath that particular burden that God has placed upon us. And remember, his yoke is easy, and his burden is light. Amen. So the best place we can be is right smack dab, I say, in the center of the will of God, no matter what's happening around us. No matter how intense the storm, no matter how high the waves, no matter what the wind's doing and what people are saying, we can still trust him no matter what, and he'll see us through. I don't know how that's going to work out in your life, but that promise is not for me to know. And here in James chapter 1, if any of you lack wisdom, so whatever circumstance you're in, you apply this to your life and you will have your needs met. Don't doubt him. Don't doubt him. That's what the faith life is all about. And here we find in verse nine of James chapter one, let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. And I say this, that we ought to rejoice when the prayers of the poor are answered. And I think the overall truth that I get from this particular verse of scripture is that aspect of humility. Making ourselves low, realizing that, you know, there's never a time where we can do it without him. And we need to realize that it's not me, it's not my ingenuity, it's not my prowess in a particular area of life. It's just really humbling myself and saying, God, I can't live this Christian life without you. I need you every moment of every day. I mean, there's never a time where I can say, as I said earlier, I got this, or I don't need to pray about this. That's why we need to take the word of God really uh, seriously in every area of our life, not just church life, but home life, work life, society life, every area of our life. Let's go to Mark chapter seven, if you would, because I see an example here of uh, humility in talking to the Savior. Mark chapter seven, hopefully I'll find the right verse this time, right off the hop. Beginning in verse 24, and the Bible here says in Mark chapter seven, verse 24, and from thence he arose and went into the borders of Tyre and Sidon and entered into a house 
and would have no man know it, but he could not be hid. For a certain woman, whose young daughter had an unclean spirit, heard of him and came and fell at his feet. And the woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nation, and she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. But Jesus said unto her, let the children first be filled. And what he's talking about there, he says, let the uh, Jews first be taken care of. For it is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it unto the dogs. And so, and what, I, I know that sounds so rude that Jesus would talk that way, but you have to understand that anyone that was considered a dog in that time was a non-Jew. And so he's using the vernacular of the day, making his point. And it says here in verse 28, And she answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And he said unto her, For this saying, Go thy way, the devil has gone out of thy daughter. And when she was come to her house, she found the devil gone out, and her daughter laid upon the bed. And what we see here, we see a woman coming in humility. Her need was so great, there was no way for her to meet this need. She had such a burden, not for just herself, but for her daughter. And we find that she comes to the Savior, and the Savior is so struck by her humility that she would come to him realizing that she really didn't have standing as far as society of that day to come to him who was a Jew and ask for help. And yet she did it anyway. What an example of humility for us. And as I think of our passage of scripture once again where it says here, a brother, let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. And remember, uh, all these verses are subsequent to the main verse here of chapter five that if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And we know the church of Jerusalem had Jews and Gentiles in it. We know in Acts chapter six that there was uh, some problems that had arisen in the church because of the multiplicity of the nations and how that there weren't all Jews there. And so we see how the gospel is open to each and every one. And so he's addressing these things and even in the subject of prayer. Well, there's not a class distinction in the will of God. You know, we look at some people as being more important than others, and God says, no, the ground is level at the cross. You know, he's no respecter of persons. And so you and I have the tendency at times to give more credence to those who can give us that appearance of wealth, that appearance of station, but yet God says, I love everyone just the same. And he's not willing that any should perish, but also his promises apply to each and every one of us, no matter where we are in life, amen? I like that. And so then we see here in verse 10 and 11, verses 10 and 11, it says, but the rich, remember he's still, he's addressing the poor, now he's addressing the rich. And he says, but the rich in that he is made low. And there we talk about submission. If you look at chapter six of 1 Timothy, God talks a bit about the wealth of people and how the, those who are wealthy have to be extremely careful because there's that tendency to rely on their money and what they can acquire with their money rather than trusting in their God who gave them the ability to make that money. And we get our distinction again, we, we get our eyes off of the Savior once again and on our circumstances. And so we're, we have to be careful that we don't become distracted no matter where we are in life, where we're, say, we're po as poor as I say of Job's tur as Job's turkey, and at the same time, just because we're poor, it doesn't mean that we can't come to the Savior and get the help we need. And just because we're rich, there's never a time where we rely on our riches and not the Savior. He says, but the rich, verse 10, in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof uh, faileth, fall, excuse me, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. And as I was thinking about this particular passage of Scripture, I was thinking about Abraham. And uh, if you'll go just one book over here, just a couple of pages here to Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter. And it's interesting to me that, that uh, you know, sometimes as, as we, we think of, 
our station in life and so on, uh, we need to just understand that there's never a time, as I said earlier, that we should be without uh, the, the focus of Jesus Christ as our only hope and our only sustaining grace in life. And Abraham, uh, and let me just say this, sometimes those who are in the middle income or the lower income bracket have the tendency to even look down at the rich and think that somehow, some way, uh, they got what they got because of manipulation and so on and so forth, and nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, look at the Bible character Job. He was a man that feared God and eschewed evil. Even Jesus, that rich man, said to the devil, have you considered my servant Job? So Job, a rich man, was a servant of the Lord. You have Abraham, Abraham and Lot, two rich man, men. Uh, one was uh, righteous and the other unrighteous in his life. And we see here where uh, you know, the rich uh, can serve God just like the poor can serve God. Amen? And we need to understand that principle. And uh, it says here in chapter 11, verse 17, it says, by faith Abraham. Now, I believe that the scriptures say that Abraham got saved in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6. And I believe that grace has always been the deciding factor uh, in, in salvation. It's not works. We're not saved by our works. You mix faith with works and it's no or grace with works and it's no longer grace, it becomes a work. That's Romans chapter 11 verse 6. But it says, by faith Abraham, now in chapter 15 verse 6, I'll just say this, it says, and Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. It talks about imputed. In other words, the righteousness of God was placed upon Abraham because Abraham believed in God meaning the coming Messiah. And so it says, by faith Abraham, when he was tried, when he was tested, he offered up Isaac. Now it's interesting, put yourself in Genesis chapter 22. In Genesis chapter 22, God has told uh, Abraham to, to uh, kill Isaac, to offer him up as a sacrifice. And so in obedience to him, he's going to obey the Lord. It didn't make sense to him, I'm sure, humanly speaking. But he said, God told me to do this. Once again, keep it in this context of what we're studying here in James. He says, by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Now understand, Abraham had been given the promise that Isaac was the child of promise. And out of his seed would one day come the Messiah. And so it didn't make any sense for Abraham to go and kill Isaac. But he said, I don't know how God's going to work all this out, but somehow he's going to do it. And look what it says in verse 18. Of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Verse 19. Accounting. This is what you and I have to do. In other words, we have to say, you know, God said it, and I'm going to take that promise, and I'm going to put it in this category because it's going to happen. And it says, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. So what he was saying is, I may have to sacrifice my son here on the altar. And I don't know how God's gonna do it, but he's gonna raise him from the dead. Because that's the child of promise. How do you know? God told me. So what am I saying here today? I'm saying here, whatever situation you go through, the answer's right here. The answer's right here. Emotionally, you may just re get repulsed by that. And your emotions may work against that. You may look at a circumstance and say, no way, no way, no way. And yet God says, yes, if I've said it in the word, which the word is complete, and it will be applicable to every area of your life, then you can take it to the bank. And somehow, some way, even though it just humanly speaking doesn't seem like it's going to work out, it will work out. Because he said it. Salvation. What did he say about that? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You realize that you're a sinner. You realize that you deserve to die and go to hell for your sin because it should have been you on that cross paying your own sin debt. But you realize that Jesus Christ came, 
humbled himself, gave his life for your sin, died in your place, and you realize that you say, I am a sinner deserving of hell, I repent of that, I'm sorry for that, I, I realize there's no way that I can earn heaven, I am gonna put my faith and trust in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, because in Leviticus it says, the life of the flesh is in the blood. And Jesus Christ shed his very life's blood for you. He paid your sin debt. You should have been the one there. But it was him taking your place. And in simple childlike faith, you say, you know what? I believe in what Jesus did for me. I believe that he died for me. He shed his blood for me. He was buried for me. He died my death. And God raised him from the dead. And you know, I believe that I put my faith and trust in what he has done on the cross according to his word, according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. According to the scriptures. And I believe in what he has done for me. And dear Lord Jesus, I take you as my personal savior. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call, 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 call. No, 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 no. Doubt, 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 doubt. No, 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 no. Why? Because he said it. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. If you're here today and you're not saved, you need to be saved. That's the starting point. But I believe I'm also talking to a lot of Christians here. That you're not doubting your salvation. But many times we encounter situations in life. And we wonder where God is. Because maybe bad things, according to the world's definition, are happening to us. It's not going the way we had planned. How could this be the will of God? Or what's God doing? Is he abandoning me? We get fearful. And he says, be not afraid. For it is I. If you lack wisdom... If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not. And what? It shall be given him. What a great God. He can be trusted. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, please. Just keep on praying till the light breaks through. Just keep on praying. He'll answer you. God keeps his promises. His word is true. Just keep on praying till the light breaks through. As you stand there today, let me ask you a question. Are you born again? Has there been that time in your life where you've set everything aside to where you've just looked at Jesus and him alone? Not the ordinances of the church, not the membership of the church, not your good deeds, because even your righteousnesses are filthy rags. And you say, I need to accept Christ as Savior. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, let me encourage you during this invitation time that you come forward, let someone take the word of God and just solidify the decision of Jesus Christ in your heart. Christian, man, as the sparks fly upward, it says in Job's, man is born to adversity. You and I as believers are gonna have trouble. We're gonna have circumstances, we're gonna have situations, and we need the wisdom of God to maneuver through it. But let me just say, God is able. God is able. Maybe you've gotten to a situation where you've been relying on yourself, where maybe you've been relying on others. Maybe you've been struck by fear. What's going to happen? Let me encourage you. As Peter began to sink, he looked back at the Savior and he said, Lord, save me. And that's exactly what Jesus did. And I don't know where you are in life, Christian. But I'm saying call out to him. Refocus. Stop looking at the circumstances. Don't go by your emotions. Look at him. Look at him. And there's no 
disappointment in him.